So, part two, introduction to the genotypes. Or, you know, genotype is a corruption of the word genetic archetype, and so it's, it's different than you know, the standard genotype phenotype thing, but it kinda, it's a cool word, I, I, kinda, I kinda like it, and I like the idea of the geno genetic archetypes, or epigenotypes is another way of putting it. In essence, really what it is is there's so many processes, how, how many ways can you come down a mountain? And how many valleys can there be on a mountain that, you know, I mean, there are, theoretically, like I say in the book, you can make a strong case that there should be 7.5 billion genotypes, but that's going to be silly, because how many things in this world are, are done redundantly? Uh, we do many things redundantly, and it turns out that by the time you do some statistical analysis in terms of how many things you can group under the same function, you know, it doesn't take too many. I mean, it's ultimately, it's like you say, well, you know, tractors can do lots of different things, right? You know, they can, they can pull stumps out of the ground, they can dig holes, they can drill holes, they can pull rocks, they can chop down trees, but, you know, you, you don't need too many different types of tractors to do all that. You know, you do need a certain type of tractor, maybe a tractor needs to be high so that it can go over the tree trunks and tree stumps. The problem with that, maybe it knocks, it tips over because the center of gravity is too high. Well, maybe you make the center of gravity lower, but now it can't go over rough terrain. So there are certain constraints that do tell you how many different jobs you need to have done. Physical numbers that tell you, okay, I can't do this with this. And that's, again, part of this, you know, algorithmic approach to these characterizations, these epigenetic characterizations. Uh, but basically, you know, past a certain point, you don't need seven and a half billion to tell you what is involved in making good tractor. You just maybe need two or three variations. How do you wind up with genotypes? You wind up with genotypes, you start off first by looking at gene frequencies. Um, the classic genes are well known, so the frequencies on just about any of the classic serological genes, by that I might mean blood types, taster status, haplotypes, HLA antigens, uh, any of those things, uh, hemoglobin types, haptoglobin types, they're, they're all published and we have not only the published frequencies but we have demographics with regard to key populations and frequencies. And here's a, these are extracted from a, a work of, of a great brilliance called uh, The History and Geography of Human Genes by Cavalli Sforza. Uh, and that's generally where you get started. I mean, you can go into looking, uh, this is another keynote work, which was Humming's, uh, Cummings' uh, fingerprints, uh, palms and soles, and you wind up, okay, here's fingerprint patterns that correlate to blood groups. Here's fingerprint patterns that correlate to nationalities. Here's fingerprint occurrences on the particular fingers that correlate to, so what you're trying to do is weave this holistic approach to the data that allows you to understand based upon those strictures that I don't want to do the same thing twice. Now, again, this is not a lecture in statistics, but if you can understand this key premise, you'll understand how we got six, which is that um, if you look at what's called multivariant analysis, multivariant analysis is a statistical tool that lets you take multidimensional data and crunch it down. And you crunch it down by essentially trying to find what are called eigenvalues, which are directions through the data that that particular direction encapsulates the most amount of variance. So that if I drew the line through the data any other way, I would have less variance than that line. Then you then make a determination that's called orthogonal to that, which means that now, by mathematical rules, if this is my vector that has maximum variance, at 90 degrees will be the next component of that data. And that's called principal components analysis. That's the basis of most of these characterizations. Now, of course, I won't tell you I did this in my head. They make statistical packages that do this. But I'll give you a good example. Well, you might be familiar with this, but basically we've been collecting data on people now for four years through a lot of software that I've written. So we go in the office, we measure fingers, we measure this, chief complaints, blah, blah, blah. Now, we're doing it to essentially give people information dietarily, but on the other side, that data is going into uh, a, a series of tables that's allowing me to analyze the occurrences independently. So in addition to all the published genetic data, all the published epidemiological data, we have a core database of about a thousand people that we followed for the last five years with regard to the occurrences of these tendencies in and of themselves. In essence, really, I, this is a cute little drawing. It, it basically, what you're doing with these types of dairy, these multivariate tools is you're compressing data from something that you can't deal with to something that you can. So for instance, if you look at this, I tell, this is the example of the Christmas tree. Let's say I have a Christmas tree here. 
okay? And I want to tell you where this Christmas ornament is. It's going to be very hard for me to tell you that it's the side by the car, a little bit underneath the other one. I mean, I could describe it to you, but it would be a description that would be useless. So what could I do? I could take a, a slide projector and project it so that I reduce the Christmas tree to two dimensions. And now I can say to you, oh, it's this one over here as we're talking about. See what I mean? We lose a little something, but we gain a little something. We lose a little bit of a take on reality, but we gain the ability to have a take on reality. Because the other thing was too complicated for us as mere humans. We can't think in three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions. Mathematicians can think in 20 dimensions. I write computer programs that routinely have 30 dimensions in them. But I can't think in 30 dimensions. Okay? So people, as we, us we, mere humans, we have to go down to two dimensions and tables and graphs and things. And we want to do that. When we do that, we want those things to become as pure and as close as what we can get. And really, the best tools for that are principal components analysis, multivariate data analysis, cluster analysis, and factor analysis. You do those, these things. You take all those numbers. You throw them in the tables. You decide to yourself, OK, what's the thing I'm looking for? And then after that, it's just, OK, well, then I'm, if I'm looking for that, it means I'm looking for this. And if I'm looking for this, it means I'm looking for this. And if it means I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this. Simple from the complex. Here's a simple, I mean, you know, again, I just want to take you through this because it kind of gives you an idea of how these things come into formation. Here's three things, okay? Here's RHD is the, the ability of a person to be blood group RH negative, right? ABOO is that's the ability of a person to be blood type O. And then Duffy A is FYA. So what you're looking at is the percentage of Africans who are RH negative is 20. The percentage of Africans who are, are blood type O is 69. And the percentage of Africans who are Duffy A is 11. And then blah, blah, blah. Asia, Europe, America, blah, blah, blah. You generate a series of what are called eigenvalues or variations that tell you that these are the axes of the variation. And you generate a matrix that tells you the numbers relative to each other. Now, of course, what does this mean to you? It means nothing to us, right? These are numbers that have no relevance. But if we plot them, we can see that if I take all that, those, just those three genes, I can plot out on a map how distant those people are. So if, by looking at those three genes, you can tell Australians are not too similar to Europeans. If Africans are in their own world, Asians are sort of more in the center, but you've got to remember this is math, so that it turns out that it looks like it's in the middle, but it turns out it's kind of coming at you because you're looking at two dimensions and it's really three, so Asians are that way. But basically, this is a kind of a notion that you're starting to get. This is how these genotypes start to separate. And here's one that just looks at their various genes. This was in my blog last week. You look at classic genes. So here we're just looking at ABO, RH, secretor, and taster. And these are how, if you put those characterizations in with the parameters that we know with regard to how the expected outcomes are, they start to split. And it turns out that if you look at it from a cladistic sense, in other words, a tree-like structure, you can see that to a certain degree, the explorer, if we were just to look at these genes, the explorer genotype is relatively unique. It doesn't have a lot of relationship to the others, whereas not unexpectedly, warriors and teachers who share some similarities because there can be a genotype that has blood type A are somewhat in common. Hunters and nomads are somewhat in com a common, but hunters and gatherers are more in common. So you can see that you know, here's the situation, gatherers and hunters, only looking at these genes, it's not the whole picture, it's only these genes, have a tendency to coalesce in such a way, Hunter, hunters and gatherers, then nomads came together, that became one group, then the warrior teachers were a second group, they came together, but along the entire road, the last person to basically share the tendencies that would allow them to be included in any of these were the explorer genotypes.